One night in August of 1986, villagers in a tiny rural town in West Africa heard a loud booming sound coming from outside. Most of the villagers thought this sound was thunder, others had no idea what it was, but the noise seemed insignificant. Little did they know, that sound was actually a death sentence. They just didn't know it yet. This story sounds like it was pulled straight out of an apocalypse movie, except it really happened. And the scary part is, it could happen again today. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to make the like button a s'more, but instead of chocolate, use mud. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. Before sunrise on August 22nd, 1986, a man named Ephraim Che woke up feeling groggy and confused. As he lay in his bed inside of his small mud brick house perched up on a cliff, he tried to remember what happened the night before. He didn't know why, but he knew, you know, something happened last night, I gotta remember it. But as he lay there kind of jogging his memory, he felt like there were holes in his memory, like he couldn't quite piece together what had happened the day or night before. However, there was one thing he distinctly remembered about the night before, and that was at some point he had heard one really loud boom of thunder outside. And Ephraim kind of somewhere in the back of his mind had thought, oh, it's going to rain tonight and maybe when I wake up it'll still be raining. And then Ephraim, no matter how hard he focused, he couldn't really remember how much time passed after hearing that booming sound and then getting in his bed the night before. But at some point he remembered being in his bed and feeling kind of sick. And that was it. That was his whole memory of the night before. And so that morning, August 22nd, when Ephraim has suddenly woken up feeling confused, he rolled over and he looked out the window right nearby his bed and he looked outside and he saw the sky was clear and the grass was totally dry. There was no indication that it had rained any time recently. And so Ephraim is thinking to himself, you know, something is definitely off here, but I just can't get my mind right. And so finally, Ephraim just sits up in his bed. He swings his legs out of his bed onto the ground, he stands up and practically falls over once he's on his feet. But he eventually gets himself back up, kind of steadies himself, and then he thinks, okay, I need to go check on my four kids and make sure they're okay. But the second Ephraim began to move in his house, it was like his body didn't obey his mind. Because moments later, instead of checking on his kids, Ephraim had wandered out his front door and was just standing out in front of his house, just kind of staring off into the distance, having no idea why he walked out there. The village where Ephraim lived was called Nios, and Nios is extremely rural. There's no electricity, there's no running water, and there's no paved roads for miles. The village is actually split into two parts. There's Upper Nios and Lower Nios. Ephraim lived in Upper Nios, right near this big, beautiful lake called Lake Nios, but the majority of villagers lived in Lower Nios, which was below the lake. So that morning, after Ephraim kind of found himself standing outside of his hut for no reason, he began looking around in hopes that other people would be out and about in Upper Nios, where he lived, so he could go talk to them and try to figure out what was wrong with him or, you know, what was going on generally. But as he scanned around Upper Nios, he saw there was not another soul anywhere. He was it. He was the only person walking around. So without giving it much thought, Ephraim decided he would just start walking down towards Lower Nios to try to talk to someone down there. And so he left his hut and he began walking down the hill that would take him to Lower Nios. After Ephraim got about halfway down this hill, right when he was near Lake Nios, he stopped because suddenly he became totally aware of the fact that the world was totally silent. Normally, the baboons in the nearby forest would be barking and insects would be humming and birds would be chirping, but now it was just completely totally silent. Even the mosquitoes that were a totally annoying constant in Ephraim's life 
were gone. It was like the entire world had just shut down. And as Ephraim is looking around, wondering what is going on here, he hears off to his right over near the lake, a woman shrieking at the top of her lungs. And so Ephraim whipped his head in the direction the screams were coming from. And he saw there was this woman about a hundred feet away. She was a local and she was looking right at Ephraim and she was barely dressed and she was ripping the rest of her clothes off and she was just screaming. And so acting on instinct, Ephraim immediately turned and just started running towards this woman. And as he's bounding towards her, getting closer and closer, he's starting to notice there's these strange shapes on the ground kind of near this woman. But as he was staring at them, he just couldn't quite place what they were. But when he got about 20 feet away from this shrieking woman, he stopped again because he realized the shapes on the ground were this woman's entire family. They were all just laying on the ground as if they were sleeping. And near them was all of their cattle also just laying on the ground as if they were sleeping. But as Ephraim stared at each of these people and each of these animals on the ground, he saw there was some blood around their noses and their mouths, and he realized no person who's sleeping would be that still. These people are all dead. These animals are all dead. And so standing there, Ephraim turned his attention from the bodies back to this woman who had dropped to her knees and she was grabbing her father's arm and yanking on it and screaming for him to please wake up. But Ephraim could tell. There was nothing she could do. Everyone was gone. And Ephraim knew somewhere deep down that, you know, he's supposed to go over and help this woman or, or console her. But suddenly this wave of fear came over him. You know, the combination of having no idea what's going on. His mind really wasn't working still. And now seeing all these dead people, it was like he just couldn't handle it. And so even though he felt terrible about this, Ephraim took one last look at this very distraught woman and her deceased family and he turned and he ran away. And when he got back to the main trail, he continued downhill in the direction of Lower Nios. Like all of you, I spend virtually all of my time daydreaming about climbing onto the back of a wild stallion and galloping down a deserted highway into an abandoned city full of zombies that I need to fight off using my wide array of strange DIY weaponry. Well, Dream no more, because today we can kill zombies for real, digitally, with Doomsday Last Survivors. And before I show you this gem of a game, I have a surprise for you. Thanks to Doomsday, not only can you now slaughter zombies with me, but also you can win $10,000 in cash prizes. Click the link in the description below and download the game and you could potentially win some of that money. In Doomsday, which is a zombie survival strategy mobile game, you can choose whatever shelters you want and then go out and recruit the strongest heroes like Catherine with her amazing spinning chainsaw and they can lead your squad and defend your base from the endless waves of zombies. Another awesome thing about this game is you can march freely and change your route at any time to attack the enemy strategically. Also, you can join an alliance to explore the world with other zombie hunters. Heck, you might even run into me and Lungy's alliance and maybe we'll let you join. So again, Doomsday, which lets you finally kill zombies for real, digitally is offering $10,000 in cash prizes. To potentially win some of that money, click the link in the description below and download the game and you will see there is a might ranking and the top five in that ranking will each walk away with $1,000 each. Outside of that might ranking, many other players will be chosen for cash prizes, some up to $500 each. Hurry and download Doomsday right now so you can join the limited time events to get the legendary hero Jaden, and a $250 gift pack for free. The next zombie wave will arrive in eight hours, so join me and old Lungy now. The villagers in Lower Nios lived in these tiny huts with tin roofs that were closely grouped together. And usually, even early in the morning, Lower Nios was a very happy and lively place with kids running around and animals walking in the road and music playing. But as Ephraim came down the hill and was within earshot of Lower Nios, it was deadly silent. And so with panic starting to rise inside of Ephraim, he began to run at full speed, hoping that when he turned the corner, and looked down the main road of Lower Nios, he would see the people he was hoping he would see. 
But when he turned the corner and looked down Main Street, all he saw were dead animals everywhere. They completely covered the streets, the sidewalk, everything. And so at this point, Ephraim was so desperate to see another person that he kept his eyes looking straight ahead so as not to look at all the dead animals and just ran straight into Lower Nios. And he turned towards the first hut he saw and he ripped the door open and he stepped inside. And as soon as he did, he just stopped because on the ground right in front of him was a woman who was very clearly deceased, just laying in the middle of the floor. She had a bowl of corn right near her hand as if she had been eating and then just fell dead. And so Ephraim, he's staring at this dead woman, and then he looks up and he realizes the bedroom is right in eyesight and he can see her family in their beds. And at first Ephraim thought, oh, they're sleeping. But then as he continued to stare through the doorway into this room, he saw none of them were moving. Their chests were not going up and down from breathing. Her whole family, they were dead too. At this, Ephraim kind of stumbled backwards out of the hut, and then he turned around to face the road he had just been on with all the animals. And when he saw the road again, it was like a piece of his brain started working properly again, because he realized those weren't animal bodies. All those bodies he saw when he came in, those were people. Yes, there were some animals, but most of them were people. He could see people slumped on top of each other, kind of piled up in doorways. He saw one person who was on his motorcycle in the middle of the road, just slumped over his handlebars. And many of the bodies were either naked or partially clothed with piles of clothing next to them, as if they had been trying to rip their clothes off as fast as they could, like the woman up at the lake had been doing. And as Ephraim looked around in horror, he also realized realized that there were no markings or cuts or wounds on any of these people. It was like they were just going about their lives when suddenly they died. And so without anything else to do, Ephraim just continued to walk in the direction he had come into the village, hoping that if he kept on going, he might run into someone who was alive. And so he begins walking down the road, he's stepping over bodies, he has no idea what to make of this, and then way down the road, up ahead, he sees there are two people coming towards him. There's a man and what looks like his son, and they're jogging down the road, stumbling over bodies, running towards Ephraim. And so Ephraim stops, expecting these people are going to stop and talk to him. But as these two people got closer, Ephraim saw both of them, the father and the son, their eyes were wide and they were looking straight ahead with kind of a distant thousand yard stare and they didn't stop for a second for Ephraim. It was like they didn't even see him. They just kept on running down the road, past all the bodies. Ephraim didn't try to stop them. He just watched as they passed. And then at some point they veered off the road and ran into the forest and disappeared. And it was at this moment that another part of Ephraim's brain seemed to kind of fit into place because as as he watched this father and son disappear, he suddenly had this memory come flooding back into his mind. And it was a memory of when he was a kid and his grandfather told him a story. And the story was about Nios villagers a long, long time ago who decided they wanted to cross Lake Nios from one side to the other. And so their leader magically parted the waters of Lake Nios, creating a walkway on the lake bed from one side to the other, and the villagers began to walk. And then about halfway across, a mosquito landed on the leader's shoulder, and when he went to slap the mosquito, he lost control of the waters, and they came crashing down and drowned all of them. Ephraim's grandfather told Ephraim that the ghosts of these drowned villagers now resided between these two big rocks located near Lower Nios. And so growing up, Ephraim, along with many other people in this village, believed that because of these ghosts, Lower Nios must be haunted. And in fact, that was actually why Ephraim built his house in Upper Nios, to avoid these ghosts. And so now, as this memory of hearing this story from his grandfather has come flooding back to Ephraim, he thinks to himself, of course, all of this is the work of those ghosts. And so fearing he would be attacked next, Ephraim turned and just continued running down the road, dodging bodies as he went. And as he ran along, periodically he would stop at various tin huts and he would fling the door open in hopes he would find some survivors. But each time he went inside, everybody in there would be dead, lying in their beds or sitting in chairs or lying on the ground. But after running for quite a while, Ephraim turned to go into yet another hut, and right as he reached for the door, the door opened on its own, and standing in front of him was the owner of this hut. His name was Joseph Nequain, and he was in much worse shape than Ephraim. 
The night before, Joseph had been inside of his hut when suddenly outside he heard that very loud booming sound that sounded like thunder to Ephraim. And then after hearing the sound, Joseph heard his daughter in her bed making this terrible snoring sound. And so instinctively, Joseph turned to walk over to his daughter to make sure she was okay, but he only got a few steps before he collapsed to the ground. He had woken up that morning with cuts all over his arms from where he fell, and he was also totally exhausted and very confused like Ephraim, and so he managed to drag himself over to his daughter's bed, and he pulled himself up onto her bed, and when he got up there, he realized his daughter was deceased. And so now, Joseph has opened the door, and he's looking out, and there's all these dead people everywhere, and Ephraim is looking back at him, and Joseph just can't process anything. He's just standing there in a total daze, and Ephraim, he wanted to say something, but no words could come out, and so he too just stood there looking at Joseph, and the two men just stood there right on the threshold of this hut, staring at each other, saying nothing for several minutes, until finally they both just extended their hands and shook silently, and then Ephraim turned around and ran back into the road. And so Joseph at first followed Ephraim kind of out of instinct, but very quickly he veered off from Ephraim, and Joseph went into his neighbor's hut to see if they were okay. But when he opened the door and went inside, he saw all of his neighbors were deceased. But Joseph, he barely reacted to this. It was like he was so numb to what was going on, he just couldn't process it. But after seeing all of his neighbors dead, somewhere deep down inside of his consciousness, Joseph knew he had to go find help. That was his mission. And so he left his neighbor's hut, he ran back to his own hut, he climbed onto his motorcycle, and he started to drive. It took Joseph a long time to drive to the next closest village, but when he got there, there were people and they were all alive. And so Joseph tried to tell them what had happened in his village, but Joseph just had such a hard time putting his thoughts together that his sentences just didn't make sense. He was kind of incoherent. And then when he did make sense, the things he was talking about, an entire village just suddenly dying, sounded crazy. And so nobody at this other village took Joseph seriously, and so that day, nobody from this other village went to Nios to see what was going on. But the next day, people from this other village did go to Nios, and when they got there, it was exactly as Joseph had said. The whole village was dead. And as authorities would soon find out, it was not just Nios that was affected by this tragic event. Several villages not far from Nios had also suffered mass casualty events on the morning of August 22nd, 1986. And soon, news of these strange mass death events in West Africa were making the news all over the world. And so on August 25th, three days after this terrible event, an American scientist named Joseph Devine turned on his TV and saw the news coming out of West Africa. The newscasters were totally baffled about how this could have happened, and no one can figure out what killed these people. And Devine is just staring at his TV in shock, and then he turns, runs to his phone, and he calls his contact at the US government and told them, you gotta send me to Nios. And because his contact knew Devine's background, he immediately said, yes, I'll get you on a flight as soon as we can. Devine and his scientific partner, Harold R. Sigurdsson, arrived in Nios two days later on August 27th. When they got there, they saw the military was burying the dead in these huge mass graves, and looking on were the few survivors of this event, like Joseph and Ephraim, along with Ephraim's family, they also survived, as well as other villagers who had come to see what happened. And so as Devine and Sigurdsson kind of maneuver their way through this crowd of very solemn people, they heard them talking about what they thought happened to all these people. And the theories ranged from secret governmental experiments to invisible super weapons, to even atomic explosions. Others, like Ephraim, believed this was paranormal, that those ghosts from the drowned villagers had attacked the village. But Devine and Sigurdsson were reasonably sure that none of those theories were correct. They felt like they did know what actually happened because they had actually witnessed a tragedy like this before, but on a much smaller scale. Two years earlier, and 60 miles south of Nios, in an area called Lake Manoon, 37 people suddenly dropped dead. 
and Devine and Sigurdsson had been sent out there to try to figure out what happened to these people. And after lots of experimentation, they came up with a theory that explained what happened. And they called it unknown, unnatural hazard. They tried to warn people in the area that this could happen again. And in fact, Sigurdsson had written an entire scientific paper about this theory and submitted it to a prestigious science journal. But nobody took Devine or Sigurdsson seriously. What they were proposing sounded made up. It sounded preposterous. But now, in Nios, it looked very much like their unknown, unnatural hazard had happened again. Devine and Sigurdsson would leave the group of people watching this mass burying take place, and they would make their way up the hill to Lake Nios, where they would immediately get to work taking water samples from deep inside the lake. And after capping these samples, the lids began popping off. And that was the moment that Devine and Sigurdsson knew their unknown, unnatural hazard theory had to be correct. Lake Nios is not your typical lake. It is a crater lake, which means it sits inside of a volcanic crater, which is a big, deep, bowl-like pit that was formed from a past volcanic explosion. And because of this volcanic activity, there is carbon dioxide in Lake Nios. A lot of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, or CO2 for short, is an odorless, invisible gas that we actually breathe out when we exhale. Now, if you inhale a little bit of CO2, that won't hurt you. If you inhale a little bit more, like a medium amount of CO2, you could feel dizzy and nauseous, your skin will start to feel like it's on fire, you'll have rapid breathing, it'll be horrible, but you'll most likely survive if you stop breathing CO2. And if you breathe in a ton of CO2, you're dead. The CO2 in Lake Nios had been trapped at the bottom of the lake for as long as anyone knew. But on the night of August 21st, 1986, something happened that caused that trapped gas to be released. Now remember, on that night, August 21st, Ephraim recalled hearing what he thought was thunder outside, and also Joseph would recall hearing a loud booming sound that night. Now, we don't know exactly what that sound was, but it's safe to say that that noise, whatever it was, was connected to releasing the gas. Maybe it was the sound of a rock slide and big rocks plummeted into the lake and hit the lake bottom and freed the gas that way. Or maybe it was just an actual volcanic eruption inside of the lake. Whatever it was, when the CO2 was freed, it bubbled to the top like it bubbled and popped off the lids of their sample tubes. And when it reached the top of the water, it kind of formed a cloud above the lake. Now, we can't see the cloud, but you can imagine a big cloud, and then this toxic CO2 cloud kind of rolled its way down the hill towards Lower Nios and other villages in the area. And when this big toxic cloud began coming in contact with people, with animals and insects, virtually all of them died. As for the few who survived, like Ephraim and his family and Joseph, they were left feeling horribly confused, disoriented, nauseous, totally dizzy from CO2 poisoning. But when they finally were able to get away from Nios and breathe fresh air, the effects of CO2 poisoning wore off and they were okay. This deadly CO2 phenomenon was exactly what happened on a much smaller scale two years earlier at Lake Manoon. It was the unknown, unnatural hazard that Devine and Sigurdsson had tried to warn people about. The official death toll of the Lake Nios disaster was more than 1,700 people and more than 3,500 livestock, although exact numbers will likely never be known. Today, people have moved back into Upper and Lower Nios, including Ephraim, despite the fact that authorities have said that lake is still very dangerous and another unknown unnatural hazard, aka a CO2 disaster, could absolutely happen again. In January of 1997, a very accomplished and Ivy League trained American chemist named Karen Wetterhahn started experiencing tingling in her lower extremities. Now, it was uncomfortable, but it wasn't enough discomfort to warrant going to a doctor or really being concerned about it. She figured it was just something kind of minor and it would go away on its own. But shortly after this tingling began, Karen started noticing she was having balance issues. She would be walking down the hallway at the university where she worked 
when inexplicably she would just lose her balance and start stumbling and would either fall to the ground or would have to lean up against the wall to steady herself. She tried to convince herself that she was just being clumsy or that she was just really tired and that's what was causing it. But shortly after these balance issues presented themselves, Karen was hit with a host of other health issues. Her speech became awkwardly slow and slurred. She began hearing this white noise ringing in her ear that just wouldn't go away. And her field of vision drastically narrowed to the point where it was like she was looking through two toilet paper rolls. Karen's husband brought her to the hospital where she underwent this very lengthy and involved examination, which involved spinal taps and brain scans to try to figure out what was going on because at first, none of the doctors had any idea. After the testing was complete and Karen was sleeping in a hospital bed and her husband was sitting by her side, a doctor walked into the room with a clipboard and he had this odd look on his face, like the news he was about to deliver he didn't really even understand. And so he consulted his clipboard one more time, looking at some paperwork, and then he looked up and he looked at Karen and then he turned to Karen's husband and he just says to him, sir, does your wife have any enemies? It would turn out Karen was suffering from a severe case of mercury toxicity. Mercury is a naturally occurring metallic element that is poisonous to humans in all its forms. And Karen had so much mercury in her body, in fact, she had 80 times the toxic threshold, that doctors believed this had to have been an intentional poisoning, that someone must have attacked Karen trying to kill her with mercury. But Karen's husband said, you know, I don't think my wife has any enemies. And then when Karen ultimately woke up, she reiterated that sentiment that she did not have any enemies. The doctors who knew Karen was a chemist, they asked her, you know, have you had any recent exposure to mercury? And through slurred and difficult to understand speech, Karen would say that she had. In fact, over the last six months leading up to this hospital visit, Karen had had lots of exposure to mercury because she was actually in charge of this huge $7 million research project that was looking to investigate the effect certain metals had on human health. And one of the metals she was studying was mercury. But Karen assured the doctor that anytime she handled any of these metals, she was always very, very cautious, especially when she handled mercury because she understood how hazardous it was. She said she always wore the proper protective equipment to make sure none of the substances made contact with her skin. And she worked under this big chemical hood, which is like a big vacuum, to ensure she didn't accidentally inhale any of the toxic fumes that came off of these metals. The doctor was totally stumped and went silent for a second. And then Karen at some point broke the silence by saying, well, you know, there was one time I did have a spill with mercury, but it was totally meaningless. And I haven't thought about it until just now, only because we're trying to figure out what happened. She would go on to tell the doctor about an incident that occurred five months earlier. She had been working at her lab at the university where she was employed when she accidentally spilled one or two tiny drops droplets of mercury onto the top of her left hand near her thumb. Now, she was wearing all of the prescribed protective equipment, including latex gloves on her hand. And so when she saw these droplets on her hand, she wasn't concerned for her health. She just followed procedure. She stopped what she was doing. She wiped the droplets off and then she left her workstation. She threw away the contaminated gloves. She thoroughly washed her hands and then put new gloves on and then just went back to work and didn't think much of it. The type of mercury that Karen had spilled on her hand was called dimethyl mercury. This is not the same thing as the shiny silver liquid we see in old thermometers. That is a hazardous substance, but it's nothing compared to dimethyl mercury. Dimethyl mercury is a clear liquid that is considered to be one of the most toxic substances on the planet. After hearing this story from Karen, the doctor agreed that overall this did seem like a kind of meaningless event because she had followed all the proper procedures and those droplets had landed on her gloves, not on her skin. But since they had no other leads to operate on, he thought it would still be a good idea to test to see if dimethyl mercury could penetrate through latex. And sure enough, after they ran some studies, they found it could. In fact, the latex gloves that all these scientists were told to wear when handling this particular substance, they did nothing. The dimethyl mercury would penetrate through the latex in seconds. But even though they had just solved the mystery of how Karen got mercury toxicity in the first place, what no one could understand was why Karen was still suffering from the effects of mercury toxicity if her only exposure to it was five months earlier, just that one time. Typically, people who have mercury toxicity, they will get better as 
soon as the source of their toxicity is removed. Meaning when the mercury goes away, they get better. And it's because the mercury kind of pools in their bloodstream and their body will naturally excrete it and they'll get better. But unfortunately for Karen, it would turn out dimethylmercury is a little bit different. It's far more lipophilic than other types of mercury. Lipophilic means a chemical substance is more likely to bind and mix with fat tissue in the body. And since blood is primarily made of water, when dimethylmercury enters the body, it does not settle in the bloodstream. Instead, it settles in organs that are made up of primarily fat. And once dimethylmercury is in your organs, it takes an exponentially longer amount of time for your body to excrete it, if it ever does. Sometimes you just die from the effects of mercury toxicity before your body can get rid of it. And in Karen's case, when she showed up to the hospital, it was already too late. Some of the dimethylmercury had already made its way up to her brain, which is an organ made up of 60% fat, and there it began to destroy her central nervous system. Three weeks after being admitted to the hospital, Karen fell into a coma. And then shortly after, one of Karen's friends was in the hospital visiting her and she saw a tear was coming down Karen's face. And so the friend turned to the doctor and said, you know, is she in pain? Is that why she's crying? And the doctor said, no, it doesn't appear her brain is able to register pain anymore. Karen would unfortunately never wake up from her coma. She would pass away on June 8th, 1997, roughly 10 months after those little droplets of dimethylmercury landed on her latex glow. In 2019, Meg Maurer was a 21-year-old senior at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. She was studying ecology and evolutionary biology and planned to pursue a career in scientific illustration after graduation. This was a field that combined her skill as a scientist, her incredible artistic ability, and her general love of nature. But despite her intellectual brilliance, what Meg was actually known for was her very uplifting personality. When her mother was asked what her daughter was like, she said, Said, well, it's like trying to describe what it's like to feel the warmth of the sun. There are not words to accurately describe what that feels like. And that was Meg. She was radiant. She was joyous. She was adventuresome. She was kind. She was really just a wonderful person to be around. In March of that year, just two months before their graduation, Meg and two of her close friends decided to go on a trip for spring break. This would be their last spring break as students and they wanted to enjoy it. Because they were all in excellent physical condition, they decided they would spend the week hiking in Georgia. When Meg told her family about her big plans, they could tell she was extremely excited and they just told her, you know, be safe and we'll see you when you get back. On the morning of their departure, which was March 5th, Meg packed her suitcase into the trunk of her small green sedan and then she drove over to her two friends apartment building and they came out and they put their suitcases into the car and then once the car was all packed and all three of them were inside, they hit the road. The drive from Tulane University to this area in Georgia where they'd be hiking took about eight hours if you didn't stop, but none of them were in a particularly big rush, and so they figured they would just stop along the way, and if they got to Georgia super late at night, so be it. After being on the road for two hours without stopping, they all needed to use the bathroom. And so Meg decided to pull over at the first rest stop she saw. And the first one she saw was in this residential town in Mississippi called Gaucher. So she pulls off the highway into this very nondescript rest stop and all three of them get out. They go into the main building and they use the restroom. Meg was the first one to be done. So she came outside and she waited right near the bathroom door. And then her two friends, they finished up as well. They came out and then the trio began walking back towards the parking lot where Meg's car was. At the same time, a man driving an 18-wheeler tractor trailer truck was bombing down the highway right outside of this rest stop. And right before he was going to pass the area where this rest stop was, he heard something fall off the back of his truck. He instinctively checked both of his mirrors to see if maybe he could see what had fallen off, but he didn't see anything in the road. And so he just pulled over onto the shoulder and got out to see what was going on. When he walked towards the back of his truck, he expected to see, you know, maybe one of the back doors had popped open or something like that. But even before he made it to the back of his truck and could even look at those back doors, he already knew what had fallen off the truck. 
two of his back tires were just gone. This truck had what's called dual rear wheels, which meant on the axle, there was not just one wheel on each side. Instead, there were two wheels on each side. So four wheels across one axle. And so each of these two wheels were bolted together and would turn at the same time and kind of functioned like one big fat tire. This gave the truck more stability and safety when it was towing. The driver in a panic looked back down the road in the direction he had just come, hoping to just see the tire somewhere, but they weren't anywhere to be found. And so not really knowing what to do, he just instinctively called his boss and told him what was going on. And his boss just said, hold tight, I will send help out to you. And so this driver is left to just stand on the side of the road and wait for help to arrive. And so as he's doing that, he's just staring back down the road in the direction he had just come as if these tires are just gonna magically appear. And as he's looking in this direction, he starts to notice on the other side of the highway, there are police cars and ambulances streaming into a rest stop that he had just passed. And it was the rest stop where Meg and her two friends had been. It would turn out when these two tires became dislodged from this truck, they went careening across the highway to the other side, across oncoming traffic, all the way up into this rest stop, and they crashed directly into Meg right as she was climbing back into her car. These two tires combined weighed almost 1,000 pounds. And so the impact killed Meg. She was pronounced dead on the scene. After an investigation, it was not conclusively determined what actually caused these tires to fall off. The likely cause was they were missing a small part known as a locking washer that costs $3 and is very easy to acquire. But regardless, at this point, the incident is considered a freak accident. In the 1850s and 1860s, Edwin Booth was the man. He was this extremely famous American actor who basically anywhere he went in America, people would know who he was. He was extremely recognizable, a household name, an A-list celebrity through and through. But his acting prowess and his career and his fame, those are not the things we remember him for. In early 1865, when Edwin was 31 years old and was at the height of his acting fame, he walked into a New Jersey train station and walked through the building to the actual platform where the trains are. And as soon as he turned a corner and actually saw the train that he wanted to board, he very quickly realized that he probably was not going to get on that train. There was already this huge throng of people out on the platform pressed up against the side of this train and they're all waving their arms around and yelling. And in the middle of this big group of people with his back pressed up against the train was the train's conductor whose job was to sell tickets in addition to driving the train. But from Edwin's perspective, it seemed fairly obvious based on the conductor's body language and what some of the people in the crowd were yelling that there just weren't enough tickets. That's why this big unruly group had formed because all these people were rushing forward trying to buy one of the last few tickets. Now, Edwin could have very easily just walked up and announced himself and shown his very famous face, and almost certainly he would have gotten a ticket. But to this point, Edwin had not been recognized in this train station, and so he wanted to keep a low profile, and so he decided against that idea. Instead, he decided he would just kind of join this big group and, you know, try to flag down the conductor and try to buy one of these tickets. And if he didn't, so be it. And so Edwin, instead of going to the back of this group, he went around to the right side, close up against the side of the train. And right as he got to the outside of the group and he turned in towards the group, he looked up at where the conductor was and he saw the conductor turning around and walking back into the train. He had clearly sold all of his tickets. And so anyone who had not purchased one yet, like Edwin, they were out of luck. They'd have to wait for the next train. Edwin was about to just walk away and wait for the next train when he noticed the crowd in front of him, they didn't disperse like he was doing. Instead, they all seemed to kind of surge forward towards the train, which was now moving. And as they pushed forward, as if they were gonna jump onto this train, even though they didn't have tickets, one man who was towards the front of this group, right up against the train, he falls to the ground and gets trapped halfway under the train. His lower half was literally on the tracks under the train, and his upper half is now under this big crowd of people that are now trampling him. And so Edwin can see very clearly that if someone does not grab this guy and pull him out soon, he's gonna get run over by the train. 
And so Edwin, without any hesitation, he jumps forward onto the ground on the platform and he reaches his hand out through the feet of all these people in this crowd and he grabs the collar of the guy who had fallen and he pulls him. And as he's pulling him, this guy who's on his back, he starts pushing with his legs and his feet. And within about a fraction of a second, they yank him out from under the train and the guy who had fallen and Edwin are lying on their backs on the platform. And before they could even talk to each other, they sat up and watched as a big train wheel rolled over that piece of track where this guy had just been laying. Edwin had saved his life. The guy he had saved was a 21 year old named Robert. And so the two of them, they stand up and they face each other for the first time. And when Robert sees Edwin, he gasps because this is Edwin Booth, the mega celebrity. He could not believe that was the guy who had just saved him. And while Robert was very thankful, he also was just totally dumbfounded at the absurdity of the situation he was in. And so eventually Edwin just says, you know, hey, you know, I'm glad I was here to help you. You know, no big deal. Next time be more careful. And then at some point the men just shook hands and parted ways. Edwin would eventually get on the next train and he would go wherever it was he needed to go. And before long, his very busy schedule kind of occupied his mind and he had kind of forgotten about what happened on the train platform. But a few days later, Edwin got a letter in the mail from a very high ranking government official thanking him for saving Robert's life. Because it would turn out Robert Lincoln was the eldest son of the then president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Now, to be clear, Edwin was extremely famous and had lots and lots of influence and knew lots of very important people, but he had never had any interaction with anyone in the Lincoln family before he met Robert on the train platform. So it was just a crazy coincidence that this mega celebrity happened to save the life of the president's son. But this coincidence was nothing compared to the coincidence that occurred next. On the evening of April 14th, 1865, so roughly three months after Edwin saved Robert, Robert's father, President Lincoln, sat down in a private seating area to watch a play at a Washington DC theater. During the production at around 10.15 PM, a man snuck in to the private seating area and shot the president to death. The killer was Edwin's younger brother, John Wilkes Booth. This assassination had nothing to do with Edwin or his interaction with Robert on the train platform. This was an assassination that was formulated and carried out completely independently. Meaning it was purely coincidence that just a few months after Edwin saved a Lincoln's life, his own brother took a Lincoln's life. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure to come back next week because we put out a brand new mind-boggling medical mystery each week from Balin Studios and Wondery. This is Mr. Balin's Medical Mysteries, hosted by me, Mr. Balin. A quick reminder, the content in this episode is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This episode was written by Matt Almas. Our editor is Heather Dundas. Sound design is by Ryan Patesta. Coordinating producer is Sophia Martins. Our senior producer is Alex Benedin. Our associate producers and researchers are Sarah Vitak and Natalie Bettendorf. Fact checking was done by Sheila Patterson for Ballin Studios. Our producer is Alyssa Tomine. Our head of production is Zach Levitt. Executive producers are myself, Mr. Ballin, and Nick Witters. For Wondery. Senior managing producer is Ryan Lohr. 
Our head of sound is Marcelino Villapando. Our producer is Julie Magruder. Additional support from Natalie Shisha. Senior producers are Laura Donna Palavoda, Dave Schilling and Matt Olmos. Our executive producers are Aaron O'Flaherty and Marshall Lewis. For 